Two British girls, Nadia and Zaina Moussen, were just 14 and 15 when their father sent them to a remote mountain village in the Yemen. They were the victims of forced marriages. After eight years, Zaina escaped home to England, leaving her sister Nadia in the Yemen. Through my experience, I know what she's going through. And it's just, it's inhuman, you know, what she's had to go through. It's just, you know, the government's got a lot to answer for because at the end of the day, they could have got us out 16 years ago if they wanted to. For their mother Miriam, it is a continuing ordeal. Her constant support has been her son, Mo. The family believe that the government failed to help the sisters as British citizens abroad. It led them to spend thousands of pounds hiring a group of American ex-commandos to mount a rescue attempt. Uh, I'll do some job on that one. And to Mo undertaking a secret mission to Nadia. If it gets my sister, I'll not do anything. Anything to be honest. Even when Nadia comes back, it ain't over. Because there's still all that hurt there. And I wish for Nadia to come home. It takes him undercover to the country he has come to hate and fear. Sparkbrook, Birmingham. This is where Miriam and Mathana Moosen ran a fish and chip shop called the Red Sea. Mathana had arrived from Aden on a British protectorate passport. They never married. They have seven children. Zaina was born in 1964 and Nadia the following year. All the children attended the local Church of England school. Nadia was very tomboy. She used to go to school in a long skirt. They always wore long skirts anyway. That, not because they had to, because that's what they used to do. But Nadia, sometimes she'd go to school in her jeans and be sent home, or they'd put her in a room of her own. <laughs> Sayana was very proud, very proud. She was studying childcare. When she left school, she was going to go back to do a course in childcare. I did love him and I trusted him. You know, I mean, if we wanted money, we'd ask him and we'd always get what we wanted. I, I mean, I couldn't say I was short of anything. I mean, I was happy. He was strict. His concern was that they didn't go out with black boys. He didn't like it. He did see them with black boys and that made him quite angry. But um, he knew they wasn't doing anything wrong. There was always with a group of girls, the friends they had. They was never on their own with boys. Mathana talked to his children of his homeland. The Yemen is known as the green land on the roof of Arabia. It was the country ruled in ancient times by the Queen of Sheba. He said I'd like it there, or well, me and Naji would like it there. It was all like sandy beaches and palm trees and very tropical. In 1980, Muthana planned a holiday for his two teenage girls. Zaina was to go out first with his friend Abdul Kader. Nadia was to follow with another friend, Goad Majid. Both had sons living in the remote Mokbana region, so it was there that Zaina was taken by Abdul Kader. I arrived at this village and we just stopped in the jeep and we all got out and I looked up at this big mountain and I saw two houses, one was low down, one was really high up and he said I live up there in that top house and I started to climb this hill and we got there and he introduced me to his family and um, 
We was in, in this little room, cabin-like room with like small wooden doors. There was no furniture, just a bed and a um, cow dung settee with a cushion on it. And all there was windows all barred up. And um, he came into this room where I was sitting and Abdulkar introduced me to him and said, this is Abdullah, who's your husband? And at this stage, I just, I just looked at him and I just started to laugh. I said, is this a joke or something? And he says, no, it's not a joke. Your dad sold you to me and you're married now and you've got to accept it because there's nothing you can do about it. And um, I still didn't believe him. And I just got on with that day. And then in the night time, he said, you have to sleep in here with Abdullah. And I said, no, I'm not. And that's when I started to get really, really frantic. In a taped message recorded later, Zaina described what happened next. They forced me to go to bed with him. And I said, no. I said, you better. Because if you don't, we'll hold you down. So I had to. I took an overdose. But they choked me until I vomited them all out, tablets. And I wrote a letter to my sister because she came a couple of weeks after me. And I wrote her a letter. I tried to warn her. But she never got the letter. I wrote to her and I told her that she's going to be married not to come. I'm enough. I couldn't stand it, her as well, but she didn't get the letter, so she came and it happened to her as well. In Birmingham, Miriam believed that her daughters were extending their holiday, but a grapevine was at work. One day, Nadi's friend Mary came into the shop. I was standing by the counter. She said, Zane and Nadi's married. And I said, don't be silly. They've gone for a holiday, they can't be married. And she said it again. Zane and Nadi are married. I got back home and I asked Mathana, and he denied it. He laughed. He said, they're not married, don't be daft. They're coming back. So I, I, I left it and I, I just kept nagging him and nagging him. And I, I kept saying to him, are Zane and Renardi married? Why haven't they come back? And then he says to me, yes, they are. And they're not coming back. I just broke down. hacked all my hair off. Just got a head of pair of scissors and hacked my hair off. I, did, I just was, went crazy, doing all sorts of stupid things. I, I, I didn't know what to do because I didn't have nobody to help me. Miriam could no longer live with Muthana. With her remaining children, she moved into a house a few streets away. Today, Muthana still believes that he has done the right thing for his daughters. This is my culture. This is my family. I'm responsible for them. I want the best for them. If I see the best for them there, it's the best for them there. You see, I am the father. I am the one who gave my consent to get married, to marry my daughter. And that's the end of the story. She has no right to say anything. It's up to me because she's underage and I am responsible for her. That's the best way for her, that's the best way, and that's it. The mountains of Mokbana swallowed up the two girls from Birmingham. They disappeared behind the veil. They now belong to their husbands' families. They should not show themselves or speak to other men. (laughs) 
Hussaina and Nadia lived in villages 40 minutes' walk from each other. They were continuously watched by family and neighbours. Letters home were intercepted, and without help from inside or outside the village, they had no prospect of escape. to live every day as it came, which was the same. There was nothing to do, nowhere to go. And, and uh, the people who we were living with started to make us like dress like the, how, how they dressed. We had to wear long dresses and trousers underneath and cover our hair. And we had to learn how to cook in their tradition, which was an open fire, and we had to put your hands in there to make the chapatis. Me and Nadia blistered in the first few weeks on our hands and feet, but you just have to carry on. I mean, they don't allow you to stop or anything, you just carry on and get on with it. The metal tub's what you have to carry on your head. You have to carry these for a couple of hours every morning and every evening. Downstairs, there's farm animals as well, where you, where you have to work. You have to grind corn on big stones. And this is where I got arthritis in my wrist from, from that. It's really hard. And um, you have to work in the fields as well. You have to grow your own crops by hand. I never accepted it from day one. I was always arguing and, and cussing them and saying, you know, you know, you can't hold me here forever. I don't want to be here, I want to go home. And all I'd get out of Abdukada was, well, there's nothing you can do about it. And I'd suffer several beatings from him as well, which also really made me hard. I think Nadia accepted it more quicker than what I did because she was younger and Nadia's a more timid person. Sometimes I just had to shake her and say, you know, what are you doing? But she was just out of it. I think she just completely lost it from day one. Back home, Miriam was desperate for help. A plea to the Queen, written on her behalf, was passed to the appropriate government department, which promised that the embassy in the Yemen would look into the matter. The reply that eventually arrived added to Miriam's anguish. We have been aware of the girls in the Yemen for some time and have tried to contact them, but have had no success. Both girls, as well as being British, are also Yemeni citizens and have married Yemeni citizens. We are unable to offer any formal assistance. There is little more we can do. Miriam felt that she had lost her daughters forever until one night in November 1982. I went to find my sister one evening. It was on the corner of my road. A car hit the phone box. I bust on my knee and my leg and my eye. And I was in class for three months. The, a policeman visited me at the house and he said, did you know you can get compensation? And I didn't know. So I went to see a solicitor and that, that's when we started. It took three years. The compensation money could pay for tickets home for her girls. But when she wrote to the Foreign Office for advice, Miriam was informed that her daughters were now considered Yemeni citizens and could only leave with their husband's permission. So she confronted the man who had taken Nadia out as a wife for his son 
and begged him to allow them to return. I went to see Goad and I says to him, look, bring them back with their husbands. I'll pay for the ticket monies. And he laughed at me. So she went there herself to set them free. By her side was her son Mo, who was then just 13 years old. In her pocket were tickets home for the daughters she had not seen for six years. Miriam, who had never even been out of Birmingham before, was undaunted. She had a plan. They went straight to the British Embassy for assistance in finding and rescuing the girls. And I saw Colin Page, he was the consul at the time. And he says, if I was you, Miss Ali, I'd go back to England immediately. Your daughters are married now, there's nothing you can do. And I just broke down and I was crying and, and I thought, God, what am I going to do? I, just, I said to him, look, I've come all this way. I, I want to see my daughters. How do I get to Taz? And he just gave me the directions to the bus stop. He didn't offer any help at all. He, he threatened my mum that something could happen to me if we went there. And that'd be best if we went, because our lives would be in danger. Uh, he was very negative. Made my mum angry, made me angry. He said, if I was you, I'd watch his son. He, he, was, try, he was trying to scare me to not go to see the girls. He didn't want me to go. Yeah, he gave me that warning. Taz, the town nearest the Mokbana Mountains. Here Miriam found a guide to take her and Mo to the villages where the girls were being held. The guy stopped the jeep and he said, this is where Zaina lives. And I was looking all around and I couldn't see no houses, nothing. And I said, where? And he said, up there. And I looked up and I couldn't see nothing. It's just this huge mountain. And we got out the jeep and the driver shouted up the mountain. And someone appeared halfway up. It was a woman. They were shouting at each other. And then after about 10 minutes, I saw this black figure coming down. And it was Zaina. I was lying on my bed and it was one afternoon and um, the woman from the house down below, she, um, she called to me and I looked out the window and I looked down and um, I saw my mum and my brother. <laughs> We just clung to each other for ages and ages. Just clung and crying and just couldn't say anything. I was six years, because I was um, pregnant with Marcus at the time. Well, I was heavily pregnant when my mum got there. Another pregnant woman appeared with a child. It was Nadia. She come in and she grabbed my mum. Give her a big old crane, she, as if she's holding her forever. And then she, my mum said, there's your brother Mo. She didn't recognise me neither. And then uh, I just, she grabbed me. I remember all the tears on my face, because her tears were coming down on my face. And she goes, are we, are we coming home? And uh it bugged me because I knew that we went to the counsellor, consulate, and he, he was negative. And uh, our hopes when we went there is we go to the British Embassy, tell them we come to get Nazana and I don't know how to get her back. But uh, 
as soon as we got there, then plans were messed up. If she hasn't got the authorities like I thought she would have had to get us out, we ain't going nowhere. And then I thought, hold on a minute, we're not going nowhere. So I says to my mum, you know, what are you going to do? She said that she, you know, well, she thought she could have got us out, and I was telling her, no, there's no way that me and Najee can walk away with you and just get out of here, no chance. Zaina was begging me to come back. You can't do nothing here, Mum. Go back, go to the press, tell them everything. And I got her to make a tape. I left her in the room herself, and she'd done the tape. I just want to go home. I just want to go to England. I want to go to my mother and live happy. I, honestly, I really, I'll, I'll kill myself if I have to. If they don't take me and my sister. On her return, Miriam waited while the government were looking into the case. But after a year when nothing happened, she invited the media to listen to Zaina's tape. What are they holding me here for? I don't want to stay. I am British. My mum looked after us all our lives, even my father. I don't even know him, I hate him. I'll never ever forgive him all his life. And I'll curse his grave. The press beat a path to Mathana. He denied selling his daughters. It's not true. It's not true at all. Because they, they, get, they, get, they, they went home for a holiday in 1980, and I never heard nothing since. So you deny that you received any money at never all? Never whatsoever. Never. I'm going to get my kids back. I don't care what they say. I know what's happened to my kids. It was when the story caused a public outcry that the government was finally forced to take action. We have no legal right to act on their behalf. It is simply, if you like, us seeking to persuade the Yemenis on moral and humanitarian grounds uh, to help the girls uh, return to the UK. At last, the two governments were cooperating to find a solution. The British Embassy in the Yemen was arranging for the two families to come to England. Zaina and Nadia, who had both given birth, were brought with their children into the town of Taz. They were full of hope. In a letter home, Nadia wrote, It's been a very horrible seven years, just slaving. I am coming home, nobody can stop me. But something did. After eight years of claiming the opposite, the British government declared that the marriages were not valid and denied visas to the so-called husbands. The girls were British citizens and free to return, but there was another problem. The children belonged to their fathers. I kept phoning them up, and then they were saying to me, we're not coming, Mum. And I was thinking, well, what's gone wrong? And I broke down, I had a nervous breakdown. And then the next thing I know, Zaina's coming home, but she had to leave Marcus. I just remember just holding him in the car and then Nigel took him off me. Um, I, wasn't, I wasn't crying at the time. It wasn't until I was on the aeroplane that things started to like rush into my head of what I'd just done. And I didn't even believe I was going anyway. She took him from me and I was gone. And um, Nigel's last words were, um, get me out, you know, hurry up and get me out with the kids. And I, I promised her that I would. Nadia's older child could talk and he begged her not to leave him. So she returned to the village to await rescue. To fulfill her promise, Zaina has since made a desperate decision. In April 1988, after eight years in the Yemen, Zaina Moussen returned to Birmingham. When we approached town, they told me to look at the rotunda, which was a, the landmark of Birmingham, and I remembered everything. It was really emotional. I just couldn't believe I was home. It was like a, a dream. 
because I always had these vivid dreams when I was in the Yemen. She'd stay in her room a lot. She was bad-tempered, very... Oh, we'd have arguments, loads of arguments, me and Zona. But I knew it wasn't her fault. She was mixed feelings because she'd left Nadia, she'd left her son. My mum was always upset, I was always upset, and she was going through everything that she'd done, and she said, we've got this to do and that to do, and you've got lots of interviews to do because we need to um, get a lot of publicity now you're here, try and get Nadia out, and, and it continued like this up until today. And then I says to her, look, why don't you write a book, Zaina? She said, what have I got to write about every day was the same. I said, but it wasn't. You was out there for eight years. Get it out, your system. Get it out. Because she wouldn't tell me. She would not talk about what they did to her, what happened to her. And um, she agreed. And after she did her book, she was OK a bit, you know? At the same time that Zaina's book was published, she turned to the law to put pressure on her father, Muthana. He was prosecuted for kidnapping and wrongful imprisonment. The case was referred to Birmingham's Crown Court. Six months later, the Director of Public Prosecutions dropped the case for lack of evidence. For four years, Zaina and her mother lost contact with Nadia, but they heard that she had two more children, both boys. But Miriam and Zaina were seeking a way to get her back to England. The government had failed them. The legal system had failed. The media had failed. But now they had money. By 1993, Zaina's book was an international bestseller. They decided to use the royalties to hire rescuers. Well, when you get as desperate as we did, and you find somebody you think's gonna get your kids with money, you do it. That's how desperate we was, and that's what we did. They had heard about a group of American ex-commandos based in Fayetteville, North Carolina, called Corporate Training Unlimited, part of Global Security International. CTU specializes in rescuing children abducted overseas. Kidnapping. Mainly we spoke to Judy Feeney and Don Feeney. Because kidnapping is illegal, there are no contracts. See to you, Don. Don Feeney claims an 80% success rate. That is his guarantee. I mean, we can't save the world, don't get me wrong. We know that. We, can't, we know we can't save the world, but you can save the world a little piece at a time. And that's what we're, that's what we're doing. On a few occasions, we met them and we talked, and they said they've rescued children in similar situations before and that they could do it. And we thought, yeah, we'll go for it. And um, I had to hand out, I had to give these people a lot of money, a lot of money. Um, at that stage, I didn't even care. I, w I would have gave them my life if I, if I had to, to get Nadia out. They said that it would they would need £65,000 and it would take them three months to do the job. So we agreed on that. And um, when we came out, we, we was negotiating with them by telephone. And then they kept saying that they needed some more money. They've got people waiting, they've got to be paid. And it just went on and on and on. Speed it up as much as you can, yeah. The last amount was the huge one. They said they needed £100,000 for a ship and a helicopter. They'd got the pilot and he needed paying. And they'd got to pay for the helicopter and the ship and it, they needed £100,000. And we discussed it and we talked about it. And because they said that, it would be a shame. We've got this far, we're ready to go. 
we paid it over. Between June and October 1993, Zaina paid over all the income she had received for the book, £185,000. It was paid to an account at Lloyds Bank, Edgware, London, called CTU UK Limited. In October, a CTU operative visited the Yemen. The family were shown a photograph of him standing here, three hours travel from where Nadia and her children were living. The Feeney's plan was that four CTU ex-commandos working with agents inside the Yemen mount a helicopter raid into the village, landing near a well. They would pick up Nadia and the children, flying low over the mountains to avoid detection by radar and land on a boat in the Red Sea. The boat would smuggle them into Djibouti, where the Feeney's contacts in the French Foreign Legion would fly them all to Europe. You just believe these people, they, they, become, they become friends because they're not Yemeni and you think that you can really trust them. You know, they've got children of their own and you don't think that they'd, you know, they'd do anything to hurt you, but looking back now, you know that you're so vulnerable that you're willing to do anything and they know that you'll give them what they want. For six months, the family waited for the operation. It never happened. At last, they were told that the money had run out. The Feenies have never given the family an explanation why so much money was spent on a rescue that never happened, and even now refuse to admit what went wrong. I believe Judy encouraged them to say, yes, we can, we can, we can do it. Because that's if we didn't think we can do it, why would we take the job? Because of the people involved and what it was going to take, and I'll say this and I'll say it one time, it was going to be something very, very short of a military operation to bring, to bring a healthy resolve to this, to bring her and the children out very safely. Uh, the mother, I think, has talked about your hiring a, a helicopter and a, and a ship. Did that take place? Um, I will not comment. We're talking about we're putting people's lives at, at risk. You know, not just ourselves, but people that work with us, and then the people on the ground that, that were actually on the ground there at risk. I will not comment. Did you provide them with any accounts on how the money was spent? Again, when it involves people, utilizing people that we were working with, you're not going to get accounts. They would not allow a trace back to them. To get people to do certain things, they had to have a sum of money up front and then talk to you again. And we're, we're talking about some major, major uh, people here. Major equipment, as you can imagine. What, what equipment was involved in um, that? I, I will not say. So how much money did you receive? Uh, it was a little over $100,000. About a hundred, and I think I had it up to about $115,000 one time. These are, these are but the documents prove, and the Inland Revenue in Britain have accepted, the Don Feeney's company, CTU UK, received £185,000, about $300,000, from Zaina Moosen. Mm -hmm. Didn't come to CTU US at all. That much money did not come here on that operation. I, I don't have it. In my, I mean, we get audited by IRS, and we don't have that much money coming through our account at all, period. So are you saying that the money is in, in London? or? Uh, or I what? have no idea where the rest of the money is. I just don't know. How could they do it? They, you know, they know what these mothers are going through, and for them to torment the mothers and you know, me and my mom the way they have, and they'll just walk away laughing because they take everything you've got, and then they leave you with nothing, and then you're back to square one again. It's, it's just hard. You know, you, you, you know, where do we turn now? We just don't know what to do. She said she wouldn't have minded, Mum. I lost everything and we still haven't got no idea. It's easy for someone to understand how they feel. I mean, here they, they give you something and they get nothing in return. And to sit there and say, I don't feel for them, is, would be a lie. You know, you feel, they, they, they gave you their trust and everything and you couldn't get it done. 
but just one of those that just didn't work. You can sit back and look at it in hindsight and say, well, yeah, it looks like these guys were just kind of pulling this along. As time went on and the people in the country started asking for more and doing less, that's when the decision was to cut it. CTU UK was wound up in July 1994 and is currently the subject of a special investigation by the Inland Revenue in Britain. Don Feeney has recently relocated his operations to the Philippines. How many shapes are there? Do this one, look. I've got a family of my own now, so I have to keep myself strong for them as well. And I've got my brother and sisters and my mum who keep my sanity as well, and I think I keep my mum's sanity. They put me through two years, wasted two years. I could have been doing something to get an idea, you know. But it, it just wasted two years for me, for Nard, for Zane, for the family. Tell me how many is there. One, two, three. Zayna lost everything. Where's number six? She faces a tax bill of £95,000 on the income from her best-selling book. During the time when Miriam and Zaina were expecting a rescue, Nadia had a sixth child. With the money gone and every official avenue exhausted, Miriam and Zaina have a last card to play in their bid to fulfil their promise to Nadia and get her home. Miriam is now working to end the family feud. With the trouble over, she hopes that Muthana will help their daughter Nadia return home. But the fish and chip shop she once shared with Muthana is now derelict and the rift between them runs deep. Mo's been down to see him, to try and convince him that he, he, want, he, he wants to be back with him. He can have his family back, but we want Nadia. The only thing that keeps me going down there is knowing how much my mum and how, how strong she's been through, through all of this. That's the only reason I go down there and show my face without losing my temper, because she, she says to me, you got to do it, so I will. Only for her and Nadia. And not because I, I got on her because of him, so I hate him. He said it's my fault. I'm the one who caused the trouble with the press, because I went to the press. She's ruined the family, the mother, ruined the family herself. She done bad things, she done lies about me, he's this and he's that and he said, but when I see her, I'll say hello to her, just let nothing happen. I feel happy because it's my duty. It's my duty to direct my children and to the right path, to the right way. He just bugs me because he thinks he's so right and he's done so much wrong. And he, I don't think he really realises what an effect he has had. Because me, I've ended up in so much trouble through to me being slightly unbalanced in life as far as anger is concerned, which is built up. There was points where if I got happy, I would beat myself up because I didn't see why I was happy and Nadia was up, over there I was suffering, so I used to um, I used to punish myself, to be honest with you. I used to uh, cut myself, bruise myself. My mum never used to know about this. This used to be things I used to do. For Mo, the time has come to play his part. He has saved enough money for tickets for Nadia, her husband and children, for a holiday in England. My life is coming and his father's blessing to take the tickets out to the Yemen. It's about time, isn't it? Yeah. I've seen you suffer too long, man. I just want to sort this out. 
I promised her that she'll come out. I promised her that everything's going to be all right. I just tried to ease her mind a bit because I know that when we're not there, all these years that have gone by, I know that these things are like flashing back in her mind because she hasn't forgotten us. I'm confident now because Mo has been to see his father and he, he feels very strongly that his father wants Nadia to come back. Um, and also he's been to see God after Majid, the father of Mohammed, and he says to Mo that there's no problem. So I'm quite confident that she will come back with Mo. If anybody can bring her back, it will be Mo. I can feel it. I know she's coming back with him. Such is the notoriety of the case in the Yemen that the real purpose of Mo's visit must remain secret. He has agreed to be accompanied on condition that nothing is done to alert the authorities to his mission or jeopardize the release of his sister. Mo has received a message that Nadia knows that he has arrived alone in the country. She will meet him 200 miles away in the town of Taz. Hello? Hello, Mum. Tell you right, Mum. Yeah, so things are looking good. You know, if they know I'm due to get here, uh, I'm sure Nadia's probably on her way. OK. So no worries. She might already be there. Yeah, she might be. So no worries. And then it's just a matter of me getting on with her husband, OK? Yeah. See, Nadia, give her a big hug for me. He has arranged to meet Nadia and her family in a flat in Taz. As Mo is a close relative, he will be permitted to speak to her alone. He wants a record of their conversations, so without her knowledge, he tapes them. When her husband is out, he talks to her about a return to England. With neither the media nor her husband present, Nadia can speak freely. Come sit down with me, Bab. Can I ask you a question? What? Answer me, honest. What would make you happy? To stay here or come home with your husband? I'm happy anywhere I stay with my husband. I'm happy. It's up to him. It's up to him. But you, you do still want to come home, yeah? Really bad. It's because of all the trouble in it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, things are getting a bit complicated here, Mum. Um, I don't know exactly. She don't wanna come, does she? She does. She's just worried about things. I think. What things, Mum? I don't know. You know, you got to put yourself in her shoes, don't you? She's gone through a lot as well as us. Coming back Sunday? Yeah, I'll be getting back Monday, mo uh, Monday, about 12 o'clock. No. So that means you got to leave her? No. I want her to come with me after her husband's gone. What's he been like? Yeah, me, I ain't really spoken too much. It makes me sick. I know that, but I told you to sort of be alright. Mom, it doesn't matter how good I'm going to be with him, right? He ain't letting Nadia out. I've got a couple of days to sort it out, Mum, and I'll keep you informed, okay? I've started to. Get some help. Yeah, I've started to be nasty with her. You know, to wake her up. What's really going on? What's going on? 
What has kept you here for 16 years? Nothing. I'm married. Okay, nothing's kept you. Are you married? Yeah. Are you really? Yeah. Swear on my life. If I wasn't married, I would never need to. Okay, kids. swear <laughs> on my life you are married. No, and I'm not swearing. Why? To I'm prove. married, I've got the paper. Yeah. Like Before you went. Well. Well, what? Did you know that you was coming to get married? I don't care about the past. And well, no, no, I've told you that what's past, past. Mum doesn't believe yeah, what you're I've saying. Yeah, but I've told you, Mum, that whether I'm with my husband, I'm okay. So please, don't give me the past anymore. Okay, and you never told Mum that you wanted to come home? Yes or no? You're nodding your head. Is that yes or no? Leave me alone now. I just want you to get the past. Don't bring it to me now. I think she's um, sad that Zaina went. Because Zaina was the strong one. And then when Zaina went, I reckon she just fell more and more into the Yemeni way. To me now, I understand more. I don't worry so much about being here. It's more I wanted to come home. You can't undo 16 years in one week, which I found out. Me being very close with Nadia before she left, I thought I could, I hoped I could um, break the barrier. I tried being nice, I tried being horrible. I tried everything and it's very frustrating that I haven't been able to do anything. And um, I'm really sorry. Nadia has now spent more of her life in the Yemen than in England. She has returned to the village and the family in Birmingham has once again lost contact. That you never told mum that you wanted to come home? Yes or no? You're nodding your head. Is that yes or no? Leave me alone now, please. Leave you alone? I just want you to get the past. Don't bring it to me now. If they say that the reality is she wants to stay out there, where's the justice? Where's the justice for the British people? Where's the justice for us? You fight for your freedom. And you don't stop just because somebody's going to tell you how she's adapted. Because that's not what... She didn't want that in the beginning. She wants what she had 16 years ago, and we want to give her that back. Because that's rightfully hers. I mean, we, all we want is justice at the end of the day. And if we're not entitled to that, then we can't be human. She will come if she want to come back. Just like Zaina, she'll come back and that's it. But I, I, I don't think she'll come back. 8,000 people in the UK are threatened with a forced marriage each year. For me, forced marriage is very much a cultural thing. It's not a religious thing. You're using the victim as a piece of property. For the victims, it's not just their freedom, but sometimes even their lives that are on the line. Let me tell you now that this is about homicide prevention. Forcing someone into marriage is now a criminal offence. We want girls to know that they'll be taken seriously, they'll be believed. 